Hello, audience. I'm happily welcoming you back after I had a summer break. I hope you enjoyed the recorded videos I've published. Um, if you haven't seen them, there are some interesting insights on value investing in Eastern Europe, as well as a talk with Gregory Warren of Morningstar, who is giving great insights into good financial companies in the US. Today, I'm having Richard Howe um, in the last stream. He's uh, located in a small town next to Boston. How is the town called? Uh, it's called Wellesley. Yeah, I already saw it uh, on Google Maps just uh, in our pre-talk, and it looks nice to live there. And you have yeah, nice it's not. Experience. It's not you know not the most exciting and exciting town in the world, but it's uh, it's fun. I have two young kids, so it's good. Uh, it's good if you have kids. That's great. Kids often have questions, and uh, I hope this curiosity of kids is also in the room with our viewers. You're welcome to type in uh, questions through the chat during our live stream, so we can pick them up. Our topic today is spin-off investing, and my first question is how Richard came into this field and what you did before looking at spin-offs. But before you can answer that question, I want to just show the disclaimer that we are clear on the on the legal side. Um, you can find the disclaimer below the video. And the main message of the disclaimer is do your own research. We are talking here about certain stocks and securities, but it's just our opinion and it's no advice, no recommendation. You have to do your own work and do it diligently. Thank you. So I'm happy to get your answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm into spin-off investing. You've given me a little time to prepare my answer, so I appreciate that. Um, so I have always been interested in investing. You know, my my dad was a large cap value portfolio manager. Um, you know, that was his career. So, um, and he he was a good teacher. So I, I had the benefit of being able to ask him a lot of questions, and he gave me a lot of good books and introduced me to Warren Buffett and uh, and and Benjamin Graham and. Uh, And so that was a lot of fun. I've always kind of been interested, one of those kids that, that was always interested in investing and, you know, participated in my investment club and, and college and, and high school. And, and then I started my career um, working What for was your a first talk. What was your first? Um, <laughs> you know what? I don't even remember my first talk uh -huh. because it was, um, I remember it was, it was 1999 and the, the internet bubble was happening And my dad was a value manager. So he was, he was having a really, really tough time, really tough go of it. And um, so just for fun, I remember, you know, I had a little like TD Ameritrade account and just for fun, he made me, uh, or he was like, Hey, here, here's a, a couple hot stocks, you know, high flyers um, that, that we should just, just, just put flyers on. I think he was just in so much pain from investing in value stocks that he, he wanted to just maybe gamble a little bit. And so I remember we invested in a couple like, you know, software startups and um, they just, they just tanked. Like it, it, it was like the top of the market. Um, but um, other than that, I remember I owned Gillette, uh, Gillette back in the day before it was acquired. That, that was one name that I owned. Um, there weren't, weren't anything, it wasn't anything that was too interesting or, or unique. It was kind of just, um, you know, big companies like that. And then, you know, a high flyer or two. Um, that that we we suffered suffered through once the bubble popped. So you're perfectly prepared for today. <laughs> and <Robin> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I don't know. I don't know. It's a little. It's a little tough. But um. But but anyway. So I started my career. You know, doing. Uh, after I graduated college, I, I started um, investing at a mutual fund company. So doing equity research, and I was able to uh, learn the business, work with some really smart individuals. Um, but the problem was we were investing in just mega cap stocks. So just, just really big you know, companies. At the time, Apple was still pretty large. I think it represented like 5% of the value index. At, at one point, it was, it was a value stock. And uh, And you know it, the game was really to compete with 
thousands of other really smart individuals to try to, you know, pick the best um, large cap stocks. And it was a really, it's a really hard game to win. And so, um, you know, the, the funds that we manage, we did our best, but they, they couldn't really outperform consistently. You know, not many actively managed uh, mutual funds do. But I always was more interested in kind of unique situations, whether it was spit, uh, spinoffs or special situations or micro, micro caps that um, not as many people were looking at. Um, and so that, that really led me um, to just look for a more inefficient place, place to invest because it just seemed to me that investing in the large caps was just, was, was just too hard for me. So maybe let's start a bit with the basics. What makes, yeah. a, in your definition, a spinoff or a special situation in a stock? Yeah, so a spinoff just is a definition. So spinoff is when a publicly traded company breaks up into two or more publicly traded companies. So a good example was United Technologies earlier this year. So United Technologies was a uh, conglomerate. So they had three divisions, one focused on aerospace, um, one focused on basically a HVAC um, called Carrier, and another division focused on manufacturing elevators and servicing elevators. Um, called Otis. That was their division called Otis. And so uh, due to activist pressure, uh, basically United Technologies Management decided to break up uh, the three companies into, or the one company, one conglomerate company into three companies. So if you owned, you know, a uh, hundred shares of United Technologies after the spinoff was complete, you owned a hundred shares of United Technologies, but you also owned shares of Otis um, elevator corporation and also carrier. So effectively it's, uh, you know, it's when a public company breaks up into two or more, uh, companies. And the reason why spinoffs tend to take place is because wall street likes simplicity. So it's, it's hard to value a big conglomerate. Um, the more complex, the harder it is to value. And it's much easier for investors and wall street analysts to, get an accurate read on financial trends and the underlying divisions and just the, the, the valuations that those divisions should garner once the uh, companies are trading independently. So, so that's really kind of at a high level, you know, what a spinoff is and why, why, um, you know, people generally like them. Why is Wall Street, why is it so hard for the Wall Street to value conglomerates or complicated companies because there are so many bright guys on the wall street and <laughs> so many good investors and so much money why is it so hard for them to to value those companies it's i, I don't know i don't know the answer to that it, but you know you know what's funny i mean i think in the 70s uh i think in the 60s and 70s conglomerates were hot you know it was a conglomerates with a lot of different divisions were, were viewed very favorably. And so the conglomerates that traded at, you know, 20, 25 earnings would buy smaller divisions at 10 times or 15 times earnings. And they would get some valuation arbitrage um, by building the company up higher and higher and, and, and growing earnings that way. Um, and maybe we'll get back to a point where, where that's the case again. I think, um, I, I don't, I don't really have a, have a good answer for it, but I just know that, It seems like Wall Street and just all investors do have a little bit of a hard time uh, with complexity. Um, you know, I know we're going to talk about IEC um, a little bit later, but IEC was a perfect example. It's it's a pretty easy company to to value prior to their spinoff of of the Match Group. They had an ownership interest in Match, an ownership interest in Angie Home Services, and a bunch bunch of cash. And even though It's pretty easy to understand those because Match was publicly traded and Angie Home Services was publicly traded as well. And, and cash was easy to value at cash. Even though that was the case, um, that company still traded at a, at a big discount, like at a negative implied uh, $2 billion enterprise value ahead of the spinoff. And there's, it doesn't really make sense why, why that's the case. And I don't even really know why it happens, but it's definitely an opportunity if you're um, – if you are interested in really kind of looking underneath the hood at these conglomerates. Interesting. Maybe we will find some studies someday where we, where people find out why it happened. Uh, this, <laughs> this, this kind of strange valuation. Um, what are drivers for returns in spinoffs? How can you make yeah. money with them is, or to put the question different? 
We- yeah, of course. So um, it's it's interesting. So there are a lot of one of you know one of the reasons that I like investing in, in spinoffs or just following potential spinoffs is because there's a lot of different ways to make money. Um, you know, these transactions are announced usually about a year, six months to a year ahead of when they actually take place. And usually when a spinoff transaction is, is announced, you know, Wall Street likes it because they like simplicity and the stock price usually pops, you know, it'll pop 15%, 20%. But then the spinoff euphoria will usually fade and the stock will come back down, down, down to earth as, uh, as you know, the 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 stock or investor sentiment is kind of stuck in a, a purgatory, if you will, where you know the transaction is not going to take place for another year. So why do you have to own it uh, before the you know a year before the transaction is going to take place? But oftentimes um, these companies that are going to be broken up essentially and clearly are going to be trading at higher valuations if they were to trade in line with their comparable peer set. Um, oftentimes you can invest in these companies ahead of the transaction. It's kind of like a reverse merger arbitrage where, um, you know, the transaction is going to happen next month. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, the, the stock price doesn't reflect, you know, what the sum of the parts should, uh, should reflect, um, once the spinoff is actually complete. And again, match was a perfect example of that about, a even a week before that transaction was going to take place. You could, you know, buy the company at a big discount uh, to what uh, anybody would, would think w- would think the stock would trade at um, once that match spinoff was complete. Um, the other uh, other interesting things, and these are, you know, some of my favorite days, is when a spinoff takes place, and it's a it's a large parent company spinning off a small subsidiary, because oftentimes. Uh, the, the, the shareholders of the large spinoff are big mutual funds or big index funds that really don't have a mandate for owning these small spinoffs. And so they just sell them rather than doing work and deciding whether or not they, it, it's worth you know, owning this small cap stock, or maybe they're even prohibited due to their mandate from owning some of these small spinoffs that they receive. But some of my favorite uh, things to watch for are, are the first couple of weeks of spinoff trading. Because if you've done your work ahead of time and you've identified a company that looks attractive, uh, you can just see this heavy, these heavy waves of indiscriminate selling pressure. And it's just like, it's like a kid on, on Christmas. Like it's just a gift because if you, if you like the company and you, you feel comfortable with the valuation, it's just a great, great way to, um, to be able to, you know, make some money. Um, Cause usually after the selling pressure, dissipates, usually those spinoff stocks will, will, will snap back um, pretty quickly. In terms of the longer term drivers of, of spinoffs and what determines whether or not they're successful, it really depends on the underlying execution of the business. It's really no different than looking at any other stock. Um, you know, things like revenue growth, margin expansion, earnings growth, free cash flow generation, all of these things are, are, are really important. And ultimately, you know, you, you might get a good deal on buying a spinoff that's just been sold indiscriminately, but ultimately if that spinoff does not execute and generate some revenue growth and, and generate some, um, some operational improvement, then that spinoff's really not going to, not going to work well. So it, it's really similar to really evaluating, you know, any other company that you would look at in the stock market. What is your take is, management and capital allocation and growth getting better after a spin-off uh, in general, or what is your take on that? Yeah. So um, I think it'll, I think it'll, it'll depend. Um, in general, uh, usually what happens is the management team of the spin-off company, you know, they used to be a small little division um, among a larger uh, corporate bureaucracy, and they're able to basically have to have their own little company. And not only that, but they're, they're compensated oftentimes in stock in that spinoff. And so oftentimes um, there's a big incentive for them to, instead of just trying to grow for growth's sake, to actually try to, you know, create shareholder value, because ultimately that's going to, that's going to benefit, um, benefit them. Um, but it's really on a case by case, um, it, you know, you really have to look at it on, on a case by case um, basis, you know, some manager, some management teams are better than others. You know, usually what I, what I like to look for is um, 
I like the management team of the spinoff to have spent considerable time at the parent company or maybe even running the division while it was part of the, the parent company because they know where the low hanging fruit is. They know where they need resources that, that the parent company has not given them. Um, a good example is a company called Contour Brands, which was a spinoff from VF Corp. And Contour Brands makes uh, jeans. So their big brands are the Wranglers jeans and Levi's jeans. They have some other brands, but they're smaller uh, and less well-known. But uh, the, basically, the entire management team from that company um, spent years and years at VF Corporation, which is a great company that's generated great returns for shareholders, uh, both through share buybacks and dividends. And so... Um, that's something that I'm really looking for. Um, you know, oftentimes it's quote unquote sexy to bring in a new management team, but that new management team usually doesn't really know, uh, doesn't have the relationships, doesn't have the institutional knowledge of the new company that they're managing to be able to make a fully informed, um, good decision. They don't know where the low hanging fruit is. And so, you know, that's really something that I, that I look for a management team that is really familiar with the spinoff before they're mandated with, with being the, uh, the CEO of the company. There are some questions from the chat coming. Uh, one is on books. What reading would you recommend on spin-off investing besides your blog? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, hopefully, um, so there's a book. So Joel Greenblatt is really kind of the godfather of special situation investing. So he wrote a book called You Can Be a, he's write, written several books, but he's he's written a book called You Can Be a Stock Market Genius. That book is is awesome. That's, that's the book that got me into um, special situations. Um, the largest chapter is on spinoffs, but he also talks about a lot of other situations like rights off offerings and and leaps and and other sorts of options so that's a really that's a really good book um there's also if you just google joel greenblatt columbia business school notes um a really nice pdf about 100 pages will pop up of the uh because joel greenblatt i don't know if he still does but he used to teach a class about special situation investing and that's really um a, a really nice resource uh resource as well um There's another old school book called, I think it's Maurice Schiller, but it's, um, it's something like making fortunes in the stock market or special situations in investing. And that's another um, good book, which talks about, that was written way before Greenblatt's book, but talks about many of the same, um, many of the same principles. Yes, from Edward, there's a follow-up question on books. On Peter Lynch wrote in one of his books that the parent co won't spin off a bad business because of potential reputational damage. But we know there has been poor performance spin-offs, especially recently. Why do you think this is? Yeah, it's interesting. So, um, yeah, because Peter Lynch made the point, which I think you know is a valid point, that a parent company would not want to spin off a a company and then have that company uh, basically fail or go bankrupt. But there have been, I mean, the most recent example is Honeywell um, spun off um, a company called Garrett Motion, which makes turbo turbochargers. And um, that business basically recently just, just put out a press release that they're evaluating basically restructuring the business. So I don't know if, if they're going to do that. But part of the reason that they want to restructure the business is because they have a lot of, they have a large asbestos liability that is legacy from, from Honeywell. And so, um, yeah, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know why that necessarily is the case. I think perhaps it used to be that spinoffs were less well followed and in order to you know make the case that you should potentially keep this spinoff or invest in the spinoff um the, the parent companies had to ensure that that the, that the spinoff companies were on on shore ground in terms of financial footing and maybe um uh, maybe in certain cases that's not the case anymore um where you know Honeywell said, hey, this is an opportunity to basically get rid of a bunch of liabilities. I'm gonna saddle this spinoff with it. And a lot of investors follow spinoffs, you know, might as well. So there's gonna be a natural buyer, buyer pool for this company, even though it's gonna have you know, a lot of liabilities. Um, you know, that, that, that could be a reason, but I think it just goes to show that 
with spinoffs, um, you know, I think you probably would be okay if you bought every, every one of them, but I think it's much more prudent to pick and choose your spots um, because there are definitely situations that you, that you want to avoid where a company is perhaps in the case of Garrett, a very cyclical company and also has a high um, debt burden and then also has the, these asbestos liabilities on top of it. Um, it just makes it makes for a tough situation heading into you know, the later inning, innings of the economic cycle, which is when um, this company was spun out. There's also a question on the, the sell-off uh, when a bigger company is, uh, spins off a smaller company. Um, if this is still noticeable that these companies are the funds are selling the smaller companies because they don't have a mandate and um, also the follow question for the other side if there aren't enough funds on the other side that are actively buying these these um, sold off companies how do you see the situation there how long does it usually take till uh, sell, the yeah. selling pressure is gone Yep. Really. Yeah. Really good question. So um, typically what you're going to see. So when you're evaluating whether a spinoff might have a, a parent company and a spinoff might have a lot of selling pressure. Uh, first of all, if there's a big difference between the expected market cap of the spinoff and the parent company, that's usually a recipe for some, some indiscriminate selling. Um, also, if the parent company is in indexes, for instance, the S&P 500 or is in you know, the S&P 400 or is in some indexes and the spinoff company has, is not going to be in an index, that can be another reason. You can, if you read the form 10, which spinoffs publish before, at least in the US, spinoffs publish before mm -hmm. they begin to tr begin trading. Um, oftentimes the risk will be, it'll be uh, highlighted that, you know, we're not going to have a natural buyer base because we're not expected to be in any indexes, but our parent company is. So that, that can usually be a clue that there might be some indiscriminate selling pressure. Um, in terms of when to establish a position, <clears throat> Usually what I like to look for is, you know, in terms of what I've, my analysis, anywhere between, you know, 40% and 60% of the shares outstanding, I look to have traded before um, a stock is bottomed. So uh, you want to see, um, you want, you want to see basically almost half the shares outstanding trade before it looks like the selling pressure um, will, will have dissipated. That That's usually what I look for. Um, another way to look for usually um, the share price, you know, this will vary, but oftentimes the share price will decline by anywhere from, you know, 40% to 60%. Um, and, you know, so, so put it this way, if, if a, a stock has gone down by 50%, and you know, 40 or 50 percent of the shares outstanding have traded, then I can be pretty comfortable that the selling pressure has reached um, has reached a low point. That's that's usually a pretty good sign. Have ETFs changed the game in the recent years? Um, so they've, I'd say, exacerbated um, the the selling pressure. Um, just the whole wave towards passive uh, funds, you know more and more of the market is going to, to index funds and to, and to ETFs. And so, you know, more and more ETFs or more and more of the parent company is, is, is held by passive institutions. And so this just basically can exacerbate um, this selling pressure and um, make it even, even more pronounced. How can you lose money if you're doing spin-off investing? <laughs> Yeah, well, you can, uh, I, you definitely can lose money. So, um, you know, like I said before, not every spinoff should be in, invested in. Um, when you're evaluating a spinoff, um, it's good to do just fundamental analysis like you would on any, on any other um, company, any other stock that you buy. Things that you want to look for, you want to look for leverage, right? You want to look for, um, you know, debt to EBITDA. Is, is, is that multiple above three or four times? Um, when are those debt maturities? Are they, do they have some um, long dated maturities? And so even if the company com comes into a little bit of trouble, They're going to have the liquidity to, to really make it make it through that downturn. You want to look at the the rate of interest on the debt. Um, a lot of spinoffs, your some spinoffs have they'll they'll have debt that's issued at a, or that's yielding about 10 or more. So if you see that, that is usually a very negative sign. It just goes to show that debt holders in the current environment with zero interest rates and negative interest rates 
are are requiring 10% interest or 12% interest from this company it just goes to show that the debt holders don't necessarily view the spinoff company in the highest regard. So that's usually a red flag. Um, other things that you want to look for, um, secular pressure, secular headwinds, right? So um, with Garrett Motion, um, they make turbochargers, which, which obviously – uh, internal combustion engines use, but electric vehicles are not going to need turbochargers. So, you know, companies with secular headwinds where the, the market is moving um, away from the product that they create are usually situations um, that, that you want to avoid. Um, and then, you know, debt is the biggest issue. Secular headwinds is another, another big issue. Um, I'd say those are probably the, the two biggest kind of red flags to look for um, when you are evaluating a spinoff. What are spinoff machines in the stock market, you know? So um, a spinoff, uh, so IAC, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. is, is, is definitely a spinoff machine. So I'm just referring to my notes. Um, IAC has spun off or basically sold. Uh, just to take a step back, they are basically a holding company um, that focuses on internet and marketplace businesses. And over the years, I mean, their, their most recent spinoff, which your audience might have uh, seen in the news, was Match.com. So the big biggest online dating company um, was basically spun off. It was previously 80% owned by IAC, but they basically bought Match, you know, about 10 years ago, um, built it up through acquisitions and through, you know, just, just built, they just spun off that business. But um, other, you know, companies that they own that are that are going to be spun off at some point, Angie Home Services, they own over 85% of that. They're going to spin that off. They own um, a video site called Vimeo, which I use. I know you use YouTube, but I use I use Vimeo for, for my site. And um, that's a great asset that I think will be very highly valued by investors once it does uh, come public. Um, Expedia, TripAdvisor, Ticketmaster, um, LendingTree. Um, all of these companies grew up in the um, under the IAC umbrella, and uh, and so yeah, IAC is is definitely um, I, I would call it a, a spinoff machine. Are there any other examples you know? Um, let's think. Other, um, I'm trying to think of other. You know what? Um, Danaher Danaher spun off Invista recently. Um, which is their dental dental equi equipment business. Mm -hmm. And I know that Danaher has historically been a very good business in terms of capital allocation and, and operating efficiency. And I'm blinking on the other, um, what's the other, um, there's another spinoff that, that Danaher did that, uh, that I'm blanking on. But Danaher is another company that, that oftentimes um, does spinoffs. If someone knows it, Please type it in the chat so we can yeah. get the name. Exactly. Let's go back to IAC. Um, what is also unique about this company besides the spin-off culture? Yeah, so I would say um, the great thing about IAC uh, is um, uh, there, there, there are a couple of things. One, um, I'd say the most important factor is that a, a guy named Barry Diller is the chairman. And he is basically has been in the media business and the internet business, um, you know, since the '90s. He is an excellent capital allocator. So not only is he a very good acquirer of businesses, so all these companies that have been spun out were initially acquired by IAC, but he's also he he he's not an empire builder. Put it that way. Um, Sorry, here's some dogs uh, going crazy. <laughs> no worries. Um, so he not only does he you know buy businesses when it makes sense, but he also he also spins them out um, when it makes sense and when um, it will add value to the company. He's also um, the capital allocation. His capital allocation skills isn't just buying and selling companies or spinning them off, but also buying back stock. So since um, 2007, the share count number of shares outstanding at IAC has gone down by I think over 50 percent. He just buys back the stock um, when it's when it's a 
uh, when it's a bargain. And so, you know, behind you, I see some of the books that are, are great books. And one of them is The Outsider CEOs. And I think there are eight, eight CEOs profiled in that book. And Barry Diller would be an, a, an, an excellent addition to that book um, because, uh, you know, I think that book argues that, that one of the most important things for CEO to do is really to allocate capital intelligently, to issue stock and buy back stock at the right time, to make acquisitions and spin companies off at the right time. And Barry Diller is basically, um, you know, in the Hall of Fame from a capital allocation perspective. One other thing that's really fun about following the company is uh, they issue. So most companies, you have to wait year round for their letter to shareholders. Um, and some companies don't even write a letter to shareholders. They'll just issue their, their 10K. Um, but I really like reading the letter to shareholders because it really gives you a good flavor for the company and what's important and how the company's doing. And IEC puts out a letter to shareholders every quarter. And it's a really intelligent, easy to read, um, basically document on kind of how the company's doing, what their vision is. And so um, that just makes it another, another company that's fun to follow um, because um, they're just so clear about what their vision is and how they're executing on that vision. Yes. One question from the chat on another company is it's SNX. Have you looked at it? Um, yes. So, um, yeah, so this company is, um, yeah, so, so this is Synax, and they're going to be spinning off their um, a business called Concentrics, Concentrics in the second half of, of this year, uh, really by the, end of, by the end of the fourth quarter. And I'm still doing um, continued work on, on this company, but they do a lot of um, IT. Um, they have IT, an IT outsourcing division. So they have you know, a company that, that can, uh, they have a division that can help you, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies um, with, their, with, their, you know, with their IT needs. Um, so if a company um, needs additional help to, for instance, um, install or service kind of a software, a software, um, a new software that, that they're using, um, this business can help with that. And then they also are an, an IT distribution company where um, – where they, they are actually kind of like a reseller and a distributor for, for other IT products. Um, the interesting thing about this business is it's, it's historically performed really well. It still trades at a very you know, cheap multiple. Last time I, I looked at it, they were trading at about 10 times earnings. Um, but the company has done a pretty good job. It's been a pretty defensive business. Uh, through the great financial crisis, the company actually grew revenue and grew earnings. And so it's one that's on my radar. I haven't um, completed my, my deep dive on it, but I, I like it at a high level. Sounds interesting. So there's still some work to do and the, the people who want to see your results can go to your blog and subscribe to see them. That's exactly. An option. <laughs> um. There's a question on um, the correlation between return and incentives for spinoffs. Do you have an answer on the correlation or do you have an answer on this correlation? Yeah. So one of the, one of the big things that, um, that Joel Greenblatt, and I bet the, whoever asked that question uh, read Joel Greenblatt's book, because one of his big things is incentives and following the incentives. So uh, when you read a Form 10, you can usually see how many shares are reserved for executive, uh, executive compensation. And Joel Greenblatt makes the point that the higher that number, the better. You know, even though the company is going to get diluted, the, uh, the management team is going to have a bigger incentive to actually uh, increase the shock, stock price because they're going to benefit through options and restricted stock. So I don't have a specific um, correlation between you know, how incentivized uh, a management team is and, and the shareholder returns. Um, my sense is that it would be, it would be uh, very, very highly correlated. Um, I mean, there are going to be certain exceptions to the rule. You know, for instance, KLX, KLX Energy was an, was an energy services spinoff um, that was the management team was an excellent management team who had created a lot of shareholder value in the past. And they had, they decided to forego salaries in exchange for getting equity in the new spinoff company. 
And even so, even though incentives were perfectly aligned and the management team had every incentive incentive to, you know, increase shareholder value, the company has done has done horribly. And it's not really been an issue with the, the company, but it's more been the energy world in, in particular has been a tough place to be, especially in the energy services industry. So it's definitely something that I look for. Um, and I'd say I'd say it is the most important factor um, when I'm when I'm evaluating, you know, a company. Um, and then other times you have to kind of read between the lines. Like for instance, a, a tiny uh, micro cap spinoff that I looked at way back in the day was called Liberated Syndication. And it's actually st- uh, still um, a pretty interesting company. I, I, full disclosure, I actually own, own some shares, um, but it's a podcast hosting company. And it was spun out of basically a company that had gone almost bankrupt because of fraud, Chinese fraud. So there's a huge taint uh, having to do with this with this company. Um, and on top of that, the new the management team of the spinoff didn't own any shares, um, but the financials look the financials looked really good. It was trading like two or three times earnings, and uh, the business was real. From my due diligence, I, I I thought that this was a, a leading podcast host. Many people use this podcast host, and so I didn't think fraud was an issue for this this division. But, you know, if you had just followed incentives, um, you would have said, oh, I can't invest in this because the management team doesn't own any stock. But what I thought would happen, and Joel Greenblatt kind of hints at this too, is that the management, part of the reason why they weren't promoting the story or where they weren't really talking to investors was because they were going to issue themselves a lot of stock and they wanted the stock price to be low so that they could issue themselves lots of shares. And that's exactly what happened. So oftentimes you kind of have to read between the lines. Um, but one thing that Joel Greenblatt does mention is oftentimes the management teams will want to basically grant themselves stock before they go out and promote promote the spinoff. And that doesn't happen all the time, um, but it happens once in a while. So it's definitely something to be aware of. And then it's a chance to invest with the management. And at this point, then you have the best promoters working for you. It's a quite, <laughs> quite good incentive in, in this case. Exactly. Let's look a bit at your process. How many spinoffs do you kiss um, every year and how many do you invest in? Um, every year yeah. and what's the return you get out of the, out of that so it's three questions but maybe let's start with the first the kissing yes. spinoffs yeah so um so so far this year i think there've been 12 spinoffs in the us and my primary focus right now is is on the us spinoffs um i i know uh, you have a big german audience so if there are any interesting mm-hmm. spinoffs in germany that people want me to look at um definitely definitely shoot me an email um but my, I, i'm primarily looking at us spinoffs so every us spinoff that, that comes out i will um do a deep dive on so um basically you know read through the form 10 i'm um, try to talk to investor relations or the management team if if i can um listen to the analyst day uh, presentation and try to get a sense of if if this is a company that i would want to invest in you know at the right price um and then if if it's a company that you want to invest in at the right price um hopefully it'll be a spin-off that experiences some indiscriminate selling pressure and so that you'll be able to you know buy it from sell from shareholders that are just forced to sell um for no other reason than they don't have a mandate to own small cap stocks so that's kind of that's kind of the the ideal situation um so so far this year there have been 12 12 spin-offs um, but in addition, in addition to that, I'm always looking at, at prior spinoffs. So spinoffs that have happened in, in prior years and, and um, whether or not those are looking attractive, whether or not uh, the fundamentals look, look really attractive or whether um, there's still ones to avoid. So, um, you know, that's, that's really, um, you know, my process to really do my work ahead of time and try to get a sense of if this is a spinoff, um, that I would want to own at the right price. And then, you know, once I've done that, I have that wealth of, of experience to fall back on um, to revisit at, at later points. Um, like Garrett Motion is a, is a spinoff that I've continued to track and I've been tempted um, to invest in it, but so far I've held off. But that's an example of a 2018 spinoff that I'm still keeping track of. Um, Core Point Lodging is another spinoff um, that took place um, I think it, uh, 2018, um, it was basically the breakup of the La Quinta brands and the real estate portion of, of that company. And uh, so that's another spinoff that I continue, continue to monitor. 
Um, in terms of my recommendations, so I generally have about, um, I, I usually have, you know, I'll, I'll usually have no more than uh, 10 individual um, rec open recommendations at, at any point, at any point in time. Um, you know, of my, you know, close recommendations, they've generated about a, you know, 24% return on average. Um, my open recommendations are a little bit lower than that. Um, I do have some, some energy exposure, unfortunately, which is, which has been a bit of a headwind. And then the other, um, interesting thing that, that, is, is another reason why it pays to follow spinoffs is oftentimes you'll see these, uh, these special situations. So a company will be spun off through what's called a split off. And so um, just to give you an example, Danaher um, spun off its company, a company called Invista, which is its dental equipment business. Um, but the way they did it is they did it through a share exchange. So if you were a Danaher shareholder, you could exchange your Danaher shares for shares of this new company, Invista. Um, but what's the motivation for exchanging your Danaher shares for the small company? The motivation to incentivize Danaher shareholders to uh, exchange their shares, you could get basically those shares at a 7% discount. And so it's basically like a free 7%. And so um, obviously those situations are, are heavily oversubscribed because it's a, it's a free 7% and in the market, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but for odd lot shareholders, so smaller shareholders who own fewer than a hundred shares, there's no, um, there, there's, um, basically your, your allocation wouldn't get prorated. You, you wouldn't get cut back in your allocation, even though it was really heavily oversubscribed. So these situations, these spinoffs are short trades. They can be like a month or even two weeks, but it's, it's a way to make, you know, a thousand bucks, uh, uh, you know, 1500 bucks in, in a period of, of a couple of weeks with, with very minimal risk. So those are also, you know, I sprinkle in a couple, a couple recommendations like that every so often, whenever I see them, just because, you know, they're interesting and it's a way to, to make a low, um, a low risk, you know, profit over, a, over a reasonably short time period. That's uh, that are interesting situations, especially if you can use them. Also in squeeze outs, there are some chances in the, in Germany, because you have a special law, and if you're buying a stock and the fair value is above it, you can go to the court and get a revaluation, and you get also some interest for the time. I think it's six percent or something like that that you've waited to get the revaluation. So it's a quite secure way of earning some money, and some people are specialized in that. There are some more questions from the chat. Um, what is the difference between the best and the worst spinners you're looking at and uh, how do you choose to be picky between them yeah so the best the best spinoffs um you know can be up you know hundreds of hundreds of percent um you know like liberated syndication uh is a is a micro cap spinoff it's still a micro cap spinoff but that's up let's see um it's up you know over 10x from from the time that it was spun off Obviously, that's not for everybody. It's a really small company, um, but then the and then the worst situations are companies that have gone bankrupt. So there are definitely spinoffs that have gone bankrupt, and so the uh, the I'd say that the the um, the variation between the best and the worst is very is very high. Um, but in terms of choosing um, the best spinoffs. <clears throat> You know, what I'm looking for is, again, similar to what you would look for in any business, which is a really good business with, you know, secular tailwinds, opportunities for margin expansion, you know, opportunities to generate real, real free cash flow and a really good management team. Um, oftentimes, you know, you're not going to find that you're not going to find everything that, you, that you're really that you're really looking for. In the case of Liberated Syndication, it was a great business with secular tailwinds trading at a dirt cheap valuation, but the management team was very sketchy. And so um, you had to get comfortable with the management team um, before um, you know, taking a flyer on that company. Another company like Contour Brands is a jeans manufacturer. So they are not, uh, you know, that's not the sexiest company by any means. But it's a pretty capital uh, efficient business. There aren't really high capex needs for that business. Um, you know, the Wrangler and Lee brands aren't super sexy, but they have staying power. There's a lot of uh, brand value there. 
I think people are going to be wearing jeans, you know, in a hundred years, I don't think jeans are necessarily going to go away. Um, and at the same time, you know, if you can get a business like that at a really, uh, really attractive valuation, then that's also, um, also a, a good place to be. But, you know, in general, um, you know, I'm looking for um, businesses with, you know, at least stable um, industry outlooks, or at least, you know, hopefully a little bit of a, a industry tailwind. Um, I'm, I'm trying to avoid those secular tailwind uh, situations or those companies with just a lot of debt, because those can obviously go to uh, go to zero in a hurry. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a threat. There's also some qu a question about liabilities uh, and environmental and asbestos liabilities. How do you evaluate them? Yeah, yeah. So in the case of um, in the case of uh, so basically there there's there's an asbestos liabilities with with Garrett Motion, mm -hmm. and the way that um, I uh, evaluate those is essentially I just look at it as as debt. So um, I, I think the maximum that Garrett Motion will have to pay uh, in any one year to Honeywell is, I think it's capped at $140 million per year. That's, or it might be $170 million a year. But anyway, it's, it's capped, but that liability isn't going to go away for, I think it's like a 30-year liability. So it's a really, it's a really meaningful um, liability. Um, in the Form 10, I haven't looked at it recently, but they estimated that that the life of the fair value of that es estimated asbestos liability was, I think, like $1.2 billion. So the way that I thought of and valued Garrett Motion was basically I added the debt um, to the enterprise value, but I also added the asbestos liability because effectively, you know, it was, it is debt. Um, it's a liability that's that's basically not going to go away until that asbestos liability goes goes to zero. So that's that's really the way um, the way the way that I think about the asbestos liability. So in your toolbox for valuation, what are the most common tools to evaluate or to or to value uh, spinoffs? Yeah, so it really depends on the situation. So uh, for instance, and I think you have to be you have to be flexible. But uh, for, for instance, some spinoffs that I've invested in in the past, um, I've invested in several um, basically uh, biotech or med tech uh, spinoffs where due to indiscriminate selling pressure, the stocks were trading below cash on the balance sheet. So they're essentially trading at a negative enterprise value. And of course, these companies were burning cash. Um, so, you know, to some extent, there was a reason why they were trading below cash, but they also had revenue approved products um, with revenue that was that was growing. And so um, even factoring in potential cash burn, um, basically the, the way that I thought about those those biotechs and med tech companies was let's look at what a, a comparable uh, company will trade it on an EV to sales basis because, None of these biotechs are making any money. And let's get a kind of a, a range of outcomes for what's a reasonable valuation and what is an expensive valuation, and then compare it to you know, where the stock is trading. And in both cases, both companies, one was New Vector, which was a med tech company. One was Aptivo, which is more of a biotech company. In both of those situations, we were able to buy them you know, way below cash on the balance sheet. And then ultimately, as revenue grew, um, you know, both companies were able to sp sp spiked up and were able to take a profit. Interestingly, and this gets back to the point of uh, basically the outcome for the spinoff will depend on the business itself. Both those companies have subsequently done poorly. New Vector has actually gone bankrupt. So they, they hit a hiccup in their, in their revenue growth and their new product launch, and they've, they went bankrupt. Um, And then, but we were able to make 100 percent on our money bef before that happened. And then Aptivo is still alive, but um, you know the company's kind of struggling along. They've they've wanted to get some partnerships with some big pharma companies, and that just hasn't materialized. So ultimately, uh, the success of the company is going to depend on the the fundamentals of the business. Um, but if you can buy a company, you know, below net cash on the balance sheet, odds are that you're going to do pretty well. If it's a company like Contour Brands, you know, which is an apparel company, 
You can look at it on a price to cash flow basis, on an EV to EBITDA basis, on a price to earnings basis. So I usually look at all those different multiples uh, versus versus peers um, to see you know where the business is trading. Um, for some companies like Aconto Brands, I'll also do a discounted cash flow analysis to get a to just get another another um, data point in terms of you know what the fair value might be. And then this isn't always the case, but if there have been acquisitions in the, the, the space, then you can also use precedent transactions to say, hey, peer companies have been acquired at you know, 15 times EBITDA. So you know, that could be a reasonable um, gauge for where this company could trade as well. But it really depends on, on, really depends on the company. I like, to use, um, you know, com- I like to use comparables, whether it's price to cash flow, EV to EBITDA. Um, but if it's like a money losing company, you might have to use an EV to revenue or EV to sales multiple. So I want to do the last call for questions. So if you have questions, please tap them in the chat. There's one good one I want to pick up from Paul. How do you lo- how long do you hold your positions when you're invested in a spin-off? Yeah, so so good question. So it really depends. So if it's a company like, for instance, a new Vectra, um, where it's sold off and it's selling below cash on the balance sheet, and then um it gets hot and people get really excited and, and bid it up, mm-hmm. you know, and and it's just super volatile. I'll have no problem, you know, if the stock rallies sharply selling out within a month or two, or even, you know, within a week or two. Um, but usually my expected time frame is, is a couple of years. Um, the ideal situation is it's a company that is in a good business, is going to grow earnings and cash flow and revenue, and is trading at a, at a cheap valuation. And so over time, earnings can grow, but the multiple can all, also expand. And so you can really get a, get a multi-bagger. But if, if a stock, you know, goes up by 50, hundred percent, you know, in, in a month or two, you know, I have no problem taking a profit there. And then the one caveat is those, those odd lot special situations that we talked about where you can make, you know, a thousand bucks or so in, in a month. Those are usually my, my shorter term recommendations where we're all only, um, you know, they're kind of self liquidating in, in a way, but, um, the, I'll usually, those will only stay open for about, about a month, um, at most. Interesting. There's another question on uh, SPACs that are merging with uh, divisions of bigger companies. Is that also kind of spin-off? And do you look at the situations? Yeah, so SPACs are it's a crazy it's a crazy environment we're in right now, um, where you know SPACs are trading above above their cash on their on their balance sheet. Um, I'll I'll keep an eye on you know those situations. Usually, if there's a lot of hype regarding a situation where a SPAC is is acquiring a division of an of another company, um, usually uh, you know that company is is pretty fairly or pretty highly valued um, by the by the acquisition vehicle. I mean, I'll, I'll look at every individual situation on its own. But um, but usually, you know, the ideal situations for me are when the spinoff takes place through a distribution because you're you're going to have no natural shareholder base, and so um, you're going to have selling pressure for no reason other than um, other than because um, a shareholder can't own a small cap stock. So those are the situations that I that I prefer. But I definitely will keep an eye on you know spinoffs that happen through through IPO or through through SPAC acquisition as well. Who are you competing with? Like, how are the who are the other players in the spin-off space? Are there specialized hedge funds? Are it smaller funds? Um, and who is interesting to follow? Maybe. Yeah. So, um, good question. Um, so, um, yeah. So there are a lot of there are a lot of good people to follow. So um, if you're not on, so I'm on Twitter and. Um, I just find a tremendous value from being on Twitter. There's um, a, a ton of people that are incredibly generous with their ideas about what they're sharing. And so I, if you're not on Twitter, I would highly recommend that you get on, get on Twitter. I'm just going off the top of my head, but value with the catalyst. Um, I follow, he, 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 he covers a lot of um, special situations and he'll highlight situations that he thinks are interesting. Um, so that's definitely somebody that I would would recommend 
um, following. Um, Clark Street Value is another blog. I think he's also on Twitter. Um, he, and he, he posts a lot of really interesting write-ups. He has a really good track record as well. Um, um, Andrew Walker, um, yet another value blog. He, he posts a lot of stuff. He's generous in terms of, of the stuff that he, that he puts out there. Um, but if you're curious, send me a message uh, on, I'm at, at Stock Spinoffs with two S's and, um, and I'll give it some more thought and, uh, and, and, and follow up with some more recommendations. So, Cause I'm just going off the top of my, uh, top of my head, but there are a lot of other people on Twitter who are really generous in terms of, you know, what they're able to share. You can send me the names and I will put them in the show notes so people can find the names That's, afterwards. That sounds great. I'll do that. Yeah. Great. Um, To finalize our talk, uh, where do you currently see the most interesting situations in the spin-off space? Where do I see the most interesting situations? Yeah. Yeah, right now, um, I think that um, I like, I've, I, right now, I think that investing ahead of the spinoff is, is pretty interesting. Um, a couple examples. One, we already talked about IEC, but right leading up to that spinoff transaction, you were able to um, you know, buy IEC for an implied negative enterprise value based on um, where the stock should trade. And um, there are a bunch of other situations that look interesting. Pfizer is going to be merging with Mylan, and that company is going to start paying a dividend. And so dividend ETFs, dividend index funds are going to have to buy that spinoff. It's going to be like indiscriminate buying pressure. Um, and based on their latest disclosure and Milan stock price, it looks like it's going to be about a 5% yield. So that's going to be a pretty juicy yield. Um, so I think that one could be, a, could be an interesting situation. Um, Nielsen is another company that is going to be breaking up that looks, looks pretty inexpensive to me, um, on a breakup. So where I'm seeing the most value is really investing ahead of the breakups, um, because like I said, once the spin-off transaction is announced, usually there's a huge pop due to the spinoff euphoria, but then the enthusiasm fades as just time sets in and more time passes and more time passes and everybody forgets about why they were excited to begin with. So if you can wait, follow these situations and then wait until you know a month or two before they're about to take place, usually there's a good kind of reverse arbitrage um, opportunity. That's interesting. Do you have something to add to our talk we didn't discuss? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, let's let's think. Uh, no, I think. I mean, I think we. I think we 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 covered most of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, come come to my site. I have a spinoff calendar, um, which you can use to kind of monitor the upcoming spinoffs. And uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, shoot me an email at rich at stockspinoffinvesting.com or just shoot me a uh, you know a message on Twitter or something. And and I'd love to you know interact with other people. And and if you have any interesting ideas that you're looking at, um, always love comparing notes. Yours. Follow this guy on Twitter. And me as well. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you very much, uh, dear audience, for the good questions. It was very helpful to get these insights and it, it helped to grow our talk and bring it to another level. So thank you very much. Enjoy your day or your evening if you're in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Tillman. This was great. Bye. So you can, if you want,